Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. So uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I've really been in the shop at all. I know uh, I've been trying to keep some videos posted and uh, putting them out a little bit, but I've actually been on the road traveling for almost the first two full weeks here in uh, January, which has uh, really put a crimp in my uh, shop time. So <laughs> I even had to do some traveling over the weekends, which is kind of unusual for, for me. but. Uh, Anyway, uh, I was tickled when I got back home uh, from some of these trips to uh, have quite a stack of uh, viewer mail that had come in. And uh, so we're going to kind of go through that, I think, mostly uh, the, this video. And it may actually get split into two videos because there's really quite a bit of stuff. We'll just see how it all works out when we edit and see how long it is. Uh, but anyway, we're going to waste no time and get started and kind of show you what's going on. First thing you'll notice probably here on the bench, and I'm going to probably leave this here uh, throughout, uh, this is the door off of the safe and uh, I've been working on getting it painted and it's actually got the, the black paint on it now. Uh, and this is uh, almost ready to go back onto the safe. Uh, I do want to, before I actually put it over there, go ahead and do the, the striping. It's got some gold uh, uh, stripes that were on here, uh, just in kind of a square pattern. I think there was either two or three different uh, just squares on here and uh, we're going to put those back on and I'll probably show you that in a video uh, when I get to that uh, which shouldn't be too much longer uh, but this will kind of be out on the bench here as we're going along but I did want to kind of show that to you guys because I know you're all interested in the safe restoration and uh, uh, this was some stuff I was working on right before I had to go out of town. In no particular order, uh, we'll just grab what's on top here. And uh, the first thing I got, and uh, this is by no means in the order it was received, uh, by the way, but um, this is a little package that came in uh, from John uh, uh, DeRosa. And uh, John lives up in Illinois, uh, West Dundee, Illinois, out, just outside the Chicago area, I believe. Uh, not in Chicago, but kind of on, on the outskirts and uh, out a little bit from there. But um, anyway, uh, in the safe restoration project we had the dial and um, quite a few of you guys caught something that I missed when we were working on that dial and that is the thread. I told you, you know it was a like 400 thousandths in diameter and a 27 threads per inch and it just didn't even it didn't even dawn on me that that is an eighth inch pipe thread and uh, and the reason that it didn't dawn on me was kind of a couple of reasons. Number one uh, it's, it's not a tapered thread like a typical pipe thread and number two uh, the, the the rod is a solid rod and I guess in my mind um, you know when I think of a pipe thread it's on a piece of pipe and this was on a piece of solid and it just didn't register it just absolutely didn't register but uh, John was actually one of the guys uh, I think that noticed this he actually sent me a nice chart of all these different uh, thread sizes uh, as a result of uh, the conversation we kind of went back and forth uh, but found out and this is something that I did not realize because I've just I've ne I don't do a lot of pipe work or whatever but there's, uh, you know, the typical pipe thread is tapered so that when you tighten it up, it's, gonna, it's actually literally going to tighten. As it go, threads in there, it's at a slight taper and it's getting larger and larger and larger, which is why a pipe thread will only go in so far. But they also make a straight pipe thread. And these straight pipe threads, it's the same threads per inch, it's the same, th all, everything is the same, but instead of being tapered, it's straight like a typical tap. And as it turns out, that is an eighth inch uh, NPS, I think this is the terminology, uh, National Pipe Straight, um, uh, uh, eighth inch 27 uh, hold is what that was. And uh, anyway, John, uh, let me zoom you in here so you can see this. So. John is a regular uh, viewer and commenter on my channel and we've actually uh, had some email conversations in the past about some stuff but John had uh, the, the right tap. Um, I guess it'd be better if I put that where you can see it. Uh, let me put it on that maybe it'll show up a little bit better in the video. But he had this uh, 27, uh, 8 inch 27 NPS tap and uh, John has told me before that uh, he has actually got a uh, eBay store uh, where he sells uh, taps and dies uh, and some tooling. Uh, he uh, gets a lot of stuff. I think uh, 
industrial places going out of business or whatever. He turns around and resells it on eBay. And he's got a lot of inventory. And he's, he's told me many times in the past, I never needed anything. Let him know. Well, as it turned out, he had this tap. And uh, he was kind enough uh, to uh, send this to me uh, to use in the project. So uh, anyway, I now have the correct tap, uh, eighth inch 27 MPS. Uh, and uh, hope to... Uh, be able to use this when we make our next dial. As you saw, the, the one that was in there had the inclusions in it. We're gonna have to recast that. So uh, this will get used uh, later on. So, And if you're in the market looking for some uh, taps and dies, uh, look up his uh, uh, eBay store, uh, store.ebay.com slash uh, tap and die 911 uh, and uh, or you can email him at tap and tap and die 911 at gmail.com and if you're looking for some oddball size or even a standard size uh, uh, tap or die uh, John can probably uh, set you right up so thanks a lot John I appreciate it so uh, next item here got a little box in the mail from uh, Gary uh, Asterwald. Uh, Gary is up in, also in Illinois, I believe. Let me uh, pull this out. All right, so Gary is uh, from St. Francisville, Illinois. And uh, he sent me a little uh, box here. I'm not gonna read all that, uh, but basically he has some uh, uh, reamers in here, some smaller size reamers. And uh, he, I'm not sure where these came from, but they got the size on them. And uh, these will be a nice addition to go in my little uh, reamer cabinet that I've got now with all these different reamers in there. And uh, anyway, that was uh, real nice. And in addition, he also sent me a pack of uh, double dipped chocolate peanuts and uh, the neat thing about this is is that this is actually packaged uh, by Rucker's Candy Company uh, out of Bridgeport, Illinois and uh, I was I'm, I'm aware that there's a Rucker's Candy Company in fact uh, uh, several people have commented about it they've sent me some pictures I've actually got a frame picture that someone gave me of a of a tractor trailer semi tractor trailer said Rucker's uh, Candy on the side of it uh, anyway, kind of interesting, but uh, this is the first actual goods I've ever gotten from Rucker's Candy before. So this is under the Rule Crink King uh, brand, but uh, it does say here uh, distributed by Rucker's Wholesale. Um, but anyway, very cool. I'll look forward to getting into these. Uh, I'm down here in peanut country in South Georgia. Uh, so, uh, and I'm a big fan of peanuts and <laughs> dip them in chocolate and that makes them even better. Uh, so thanks a lot, Gary, for the reamers and uh, for the snack. I'll probably uh, kind of hide these somewhere out here in the shop where none of my children or my wife can get into them and I can save them all for myself. So got another box here. This one is from Jeff Woods. And uh, Jeff is a guy I've actually known for quite some time over on the uh, old woodworking machines uh, uh, discussion forums, uh, OWWM.org, uh, and he also uh, watches my videos and kind of keeps up with what's going on over there as well. But uh, Jeff actually sent me an email uh, back, it probably was over Christmas, I think, um, actually asking some, hit my opinion on a piece he's trying to restore for a machine that he's working on. And uh, as we were emailing back and forth, he said, hey, I've got something that you might use I picked up somewhere. He doesn't do machine shop work. He's strictly a woodworker. Uh, but he picked up a bunch of uh, uh, boring bars. Uh, and uh, anyway, he said, I'm going to send these to you. So let me zoom you in here and we'll show you what we got. These are uh, little boring bars that like go in a boring head that you use on a, a milling machine or you can use these on a lathe. You can use these on a lot of things. Uh, I believe most of these are carbide tipped, uh, but there's a whole bunch of them. They're, you know, quite honestly, they're they're pretty pretty heavily used, but you know, there's probably still some life in them. And uh, you know, these are real handy to have. And I I think these will actually fit uh, my boring head. Um, and if not, I'm sure we can find other uses for them as well. So that one there looks like the carbide's almost completely gone home, but most of these have a use. Well, that one there's chipped out as well. 
But uh, anyway, that one there's still got some carbide on there. So anyway, we got a little set of uh, um, boring bars here that go in a uh, boring head. And uh, anyway, it'd be nice to have some extra tooling around. Uh, you never know when this kind of stuff comes in handy. And uh, you know, this is a good set to have too from the standpoint that if I ever need to do a custom grind for some unusual job, you know, I wouldn't feel bad about grabbing one of these and, and grinding on it uh, rather than using one of my, my nicer ones that I have. So anyway, we'll put these in the toolbox and I'm sure they'll get used at some point in time. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeff. Up next here is a box uh, that came in from Peter Foats. Uh, Peter is out in Bountiful, Utah, uh, which is in the Salt Lake City area. And uh, Peter actually uh, had contacted me back, it's been several months ago now actually, I think it was uh, even back before Thanksgiving, uh, but he had sent me a message and told me that he does uh, some tool grinding. And uh, I think I had had a video where I had some uh, end mills that needed to be resharpened and he said, uh, you know, send me some and he'd see about doing some resharpening. Well, I, I, I quite honestly dug up a really big pile of end mills and, and I, it, it was so many that I just felt guilty about sending that many to him. So actually what I did was I, I sent Peter a bunch of end mills. Uh, a lot of them were smaller in mills uh, and I said look you know I don't need all these back uh, keep some for yourself you know use them whatever it's just uh, in toolboxes and different things that I've gotten over the years I get a lot of I've, I, I had a bunch of end mills and uh, you know and I just kind of threw them all in a in a little a coffee can or something and they were just sitting there they were of no use and uh, so anyway I sent a bunch to him and I said you know there were some of the bigger ones in particular that I wanted to get resharpened and uh, Peter was kind enough uh, to do some resharpening for me and uh, he returned those back to me in fact Peter I'm not sure but I think some of these are actually ones that, that I didn't send you that you sent me back uh, I may be wrong. I, it's, it's been a while since I sent them, so I can't remember exactly what I sent them, but I think some of these uh, were some extras that he sent back along, uh, which is really nice. But let me zoom you in here and kind of show you what we got. As you can see, there's some really nice, pretty good size end mills in here. And like I said, I, some of these I don't remember <laughs> sending to Peter. I may have, um, but there's some really nice big end mills in here. Uh, that I sent to him uh, or that I that was sent back to me now some of these smaller ones like this I mean this is still a one inch uh, end mill. I know I sent him some of these. That's a three-quarter inch um, Anyway, he had these all packed up real nice and I've kind of pulled them all out Where it'd be easier to get to but anyway as you can see a nice uh, selection here of some uh, larger size end mills primarily uh, that he went in and reground for me and uh, I haven't even un pulled off all these were where he had coated and I'm gonna this one here's in a, in a box so I'm gonna kind of just check out his work because uh, I haven't even examined any of these real close all right so that is nice, you know, I, I, I remember this particular one because this is one, this is a three quarter inch, I think that I had bought and used and I was using on something and, and really just burn it up kind of bad. And this is one of the ones that he resharpened. And I mean, that thing looks brand spanking new. So anyway, um, Peter, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm back in business here, uh, you know, and particularly some of these bigger end mills. These will be great for uh, using on the uh, uh, the big horizontal mill uh, for all kinds of jobs that come up. Some of these are two inches in diameter. You know, some of these are two flutes. Um, you know, this one here looks like a six flute. Uh, anyway, Peter, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> this is really awesome. Uh, to, to have some nice uh, sharpened tools here and being able to to kind of salvage some of these this tooling that um, um, you know was just kind of put aside because it was just so dull uh, that it really wasn't usable anymore so this will be this is awesome thank you sir all right so the next item here is not a gift not a viewer gift but this is an eBay purchase uh, that I just picked up so I had shared with you guys in a recent video that I'm kind of on a quest uh, for a complete set of uh, Greenfield uh, 
tap and die company um, tap handles or tap wrenches and I was uh, particularly needing a double zero, a zero, and a number four size tap handle to kind of round out my collection. And uh, I saw this uh, double zero, which is the smallest, I think it's the smallest one that Greenfield ever made, uh, or at least at the time that my catalog was printed in the early 1940s, it was the smallest one in their catalog at that time. Anyway, I saw one of these come up for sale on eBay, and uh, I think I ended up having to pay, with shipping, I think it was about 20 bucks. Uh, for this, which I thought was, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a steal, but it wasn't a terrible deal either. Uh, but I'll zoom you guys in here so you can kind of see this cute little thing. So obviously, this is for your smaller taps. You can see, you know, by the size of my hand, this is a pretty small uh, tap wrench. And uh, anyway, it's in great shape. Uh, it's the size double zero. And anyway, that's uh, one more. I checked off my list. I'm still looking for a zero and a number four, and um, we'll find them. Uh, just got to wait for them to show up, but they'll make themselves available. Uh, these aren't super rare, but uh, anyway, I'm just I'm just looking forward to getting my full set. Uh, the, that collector in me. I don't like to be classified as a collector, but sometimes uh, I guess I, I do kind of become a collector. And uh, this way, this case, I'm, I just really want a complete set of these, these tap wrenches. So anyway, we'll find them. This next item is kind of an interesting item. So um, you guys might have seen the series of videos I did uh, a couple of weeks ago where I made a set of these uh, key plugs for a crescent joiner or planer head. And um, uh, anyway, a fellow was needing some uh, and I volunteered to make some for him. And I made some extras. And uh, again, I posted them, uh, the extra ones up for sale over on the uh, OWWM a discussion for them because I knew there were some guys looking for them and sure enough uh, there were and I pretty much have sold uh, all but maybe two or three of the, my extras now um, but as I was when I posted that I thought it was funny because right after I posted it there was a gentleman down in Louisiana that contacted me and said man I wish I had known that you could make those because he said I bought a joiner and it was missing like three or four of them and I ended up buying a whole head for a eight inch crescent joiner that was for sale on eBay just to get a couple of key plugs out of to uh, finish out my joiner. And uh, when I saw that, I couldn't believe it because um, I actually have a crescent eight inch joiner that I bought years and years ago. It's a very, very early crescent, made in the early 1900s, I think about 1903, uh, based on the serial number. Uh, and uh, when I got that joiner, uh, it's got a square head in it. Uh, and the square heads in a joiner is a very dangerous thing. It's, it's a square head that you bolt knives down to, similar to how we put knives on the uh, planar matcher that I'm working on restoring. In the planar matcher situation, it's really not a big deal because realistically, you're never going to get your hands close to it. With a joiner, you're literally running your hands almost right over this with just a board in between it. And uh, back in the early days, those square heads were really bad, known for, as people on a joiner in particular, where you were working in close uh, you know, uh, quarters with it, that it would actually just pull your whole arm down in there because it be, had these square uh, corners coming up and it would literally just pull it down in there and it would amputate many people. It was very dangerous. And uh, anyway, I bought that joiner. It had a square head. And I said, well, maybe one day I'll find a round safety head for it. Well, in about 1908, uh, Crescent came out with their round safety head. And the biggest difference is, is that the cylinder on here is round rather than square. You know, you can still get your hand down on this thing while it's running, and believe me, it can do some serious damage, but if you get your hand on this, you know, it's going to take some skin off, it's going to probably take some meat off, but it's not going to pull your whole arm in and take it out to the elbow. Uh, so this was considered a safety head, and, and anytime you're using a joiner, you should always use a machine that has a safety head, and now all of them do, and really from probably the, the 19 teens or 20s on, uh, pretty much all the joiners were made with the safety heads because it was such a big issue. Well, anyway, when he told me he had bought an eight inch uh, crescent head, safety head, I'm like, do you still have the head? Because, you know, I, I, I could really use it if, because uh, that's kind of what I've been waiting on to restore that machine. And sure enough, he still had the head, had no use for it. Uh, and uh, anyway, he ended up sending this to me, 
uh, and I was real tickled to get it. It's in great shape. Uh, it's still got the throat plates in there, even still has the knives in it. Uh, he just pulled the, uh, the key plugs out and it takes six of them. It's a two knife head uh, and he pulled the key plugs out and uh, sent, sent it to me, but hey, I just made key plugs. So I pulled six of them out to keep for myself uh, on here. But uh, I had some questions from guys on exactly how these work. So since I've got a safety head right here, uh, I'm gonna zoom you in here and we'll kind of give show you how this particular piece works uh, to maybe kind of finish that story uh, on making the key plugs. So Crescent designed the safety head in 190, in the early 1900s, I think it was actually about 1907, they were granted a patent in, on uh, December 14th, 1909 uh, is when the patent was actually granted. And of course, the patent was applied for probably about a year before that. You know, they weren't the only company to make a safety head. Oliver, uh, another big woodworking company, also had a safety head, although theirs was a clamshell design which actually later had some other problems as well. But this, this design was one of the early safety heads that actually came out on the market. Uh, and the way that they actually clamped uh, the knives, and, and by the way, uh, Crescent used uh, this design. Uh, they were actually still making joiners. Uh, uh, actually, Enterprise had purchased the Crescent brand, and they were still making these machines up into the early 1970s using this same head, but many, many, many joiners and planers uh, were designed using this. So, uh, you know, they have the, the slots milled in here, and I tell you what, let me turn this around. I think you can kind of see that a little bit better. So there's a slot in there. Uh, they have these uh, uh, holes for the key plugs are drilled at an angle to uh, the slot here that the, uh, the throat piece goes in here and then the knife actually uh, uh, goes right on top of that. I guess the knife actually goes this way, I believe. And um, you would adjust that knife up to the right height and there's a little burr on there, but you kind of see how it goes. Uh, but that knife would be in there. But you had to, basically the way this worked is you needed to tighten this knife up by sandwiching this throat plate up in there. So uh, again, the, um, the key plugs uh, fit down in these holes. And let me get a different one that I can retract a little bit easier. I got just, a, this one's got a longer uh, handle on it where I can kind of get it out. But if you look, that goes down there and that's the angle that we milled on there is the same angle as back here. But when it goes all the way down, it's actually below that. And when you tighten up the bolt, and of course it's not sticking out like this, it's just a set screw, but when you tighten it up, it raises that up. And as it raises that up, it's putting pressure against that throat plate. And of course you have the series I'm in here. And when you tighten all these up, it just squeezes that knife in there to hold it in place. So it's kind of a unique uh, design. Uh, to my knowledge, Crescent was the only company that really used this design. Uh, and later on, they came up with some, some designs that, that really are, are even used now. They still have a throat plate, uh, but instead of using something like this, there's actually a little jack screw in them. They take a wrench. Uh, and that works well. Quite honestly, I like this setup because I think you actually get more pressure on that knife holding it in place with this setup than you do the little jack screws uh, that they use now. But as you can imagine, uh, these heads were expensive to make. There's a lot of machining involved in them uh, to get them just right. Uh, a lot of holes and stuff, a lot of milling uh, to get these built. So these were um, you know, quite costly to make and that's probably why they went to the more simpler designs. But anyway, I wanted to share that with you guys to kind of show how these key plugs work. And um, now that we've got a safety head, maybe uh, future restoration for me will be getting that little eight inch joiner uh, running. It's a Babbitt bearing uh, machine and this one was made for Babbitt bearings as well. Uh, so, you know, really all I have to do is pull that square head out. This one should drop right in. We'll have to pour a new Babbitt for it and, uh, you know, we'll have a newer, safer head uh, on that older machine uh, and we can safely put that machine back in use. So the next thing I want to share with you guys is I'm going to actually take a little point of privilege here. And this is a little bit off topic, I guess, from my normal um, uh, machine shop and uh, shop related activities. Uh, 
Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I, I had done. I actually sent out uh, an item to be repaired recently that was way beyond my capability, something that I have no experience in. And uh, anyway, I thought it was pretty neat, and I was going to share it with you. So um, I've got here a pocket watch uh, that actually belonged to my grandfather, uh, James Rucker, uh, James Herman Rucker Sr. My dad was James Herman Rucker Jr. Uh, thank the good Lord. Uh, they didn't pass that Herman name down. Herman name down to a third, uh, and decided to name me Keith and not James Herman Rucker the third. I don't know that I could have gone by Herman. If your name's Herman, my apologies. I'm glad mine isn't. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, this watch belonged to my grandfather, uh, who died before I was born. I didn't ever know him. He was a uh, engineer. Uh, that worked, uh, not a train engineer, but a mechanical engineer. Uh, interesting, he never went to college. Uh, he was just uh, uh, someone who was mechanically good. And uh, in the 1930s, uh, during, toward the tail end of the Great Depression, he was out looking for a job. Got a job working uh, with the earth moving equipment up in Toccoa, Georgia. Uh, and uh, they uh, hired him, he went to work for them. And he worked his way up from the factory floor to uh, before uh, he was actually uh, uh, died in the 60s. Uh, he was actually had worked his way up to being an engineer for the company. And again, he was uh, had had nothing but I guess a high school education. I'm not even sure that he had a high school education uh, at that time. You know, it was it was very uncommon for people not to actually finish school uh, during the depression. But just uh, had that gift. Uh, but anyway, this was his pocket watch, and I've actually had this watch. Um, since my dad passed it down to me back in the late 1980s and uh, I actually had it worked on. It wasn't running and I took it to a local jeweler, jewel, local jeweler in town, can't speak, uh, that uh, was a watchmaker and this was about 1988 or 1989, somewhere along in there. And uh, he had the whole set up there in the jewelry store up in North Georgia and he went through the watch and and got it running for me. And it ran for many, many years up until probably about five years ago. Uh, for whatever reason, it got to where it just, it wouldn't stay running. You could, you could wind it up and then it would run for a little while and it would just quit. And I was kind of frustrated. I, I don't, I didn't, don't wear it a lot. Actually, at, at one time I did wear it uh, almost every day. It was, it was my watch that I used. Uh, uh, then I quit wearing it. Uh, and I just kind of wore it on special occasions, but I wanted to get it fixed and I did some research and I found a gentleman up in Oregon, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Sexton, who is a second generation watchmaker himself. His grandfather uh, was a professionally trained watchmaker and a very uh, well respected watchmaker uh, back during, I guess, probably uh, about the same time my grandfather was uh, uh, coming along. And uh, anyway, uh, Jeff learned the trade from his grandfather and his grandfather has passed on, but he's kept the trade going. And I think it's kind of a hobby for him, but he will take pocket watches in and do a restoration on them. And he is actually pretty well known in the pocket watch community as being an expert on Elgin watches. And uh, uh, he's actually got a website uh, devoted to Elgin watches. Uh, elgintime.com uh, that you can go check out. But anyway, um, I, I sent the pocket, this pocket watch off to Jeff back before Christmas, or actually back before Thanksgiving, and uh, he had it a couple of weeks, uh, did some repairs to it, and uh, sent it back to me, and it's great. And uh, I'll zoom you guys in here, we can see it a little bit later in, in just a minute, but uh, I was so happy with the results of this first one that he did uh, that I actually sent him another pocket watch. And uh, this one here, this kind of a nickel plated one, uh, this is a, also an Elgin, both of these are Elgins. I think the, the gold one here that was my grandfather's was purchased, uh, I can't remember if it was the 19, late 40s, early 50s, somewhere along there, I'd have to check out the serial number on it again. My shop cat's down here getting into something. I'm seeing, found some, uh, found some packing peanuts and is making a mess. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this one belonged to my great grandfather, Mr. Mose Fleming, uh, who was my dad's mother's father. And uh, he's actually the same one that has that on the safe that I'm restoring. And when I got the gold watch, I was also given this one. And uh, it was also not working. And um, I decided to have the gold one worked on back in the 80s. But this one here actually had a few more. It was The guy told me it was going to be a little bit more work to get this one going. And, you know, I was just a 
you know, kid out of school working a machine shop part, you know, not part time, but you know, didn't have a lot of money. So I just got the one watch fixed. Well, I ended up sending this one back to him. This one here, I think was made in 1903. Um, and like I said, I knew that it had some issues, but Jeff went through it uh, and it is now running as well. This is, and when I got this watch back uh, just the other day, it's the first time I have ever seen this watch run in my life. So I was tickled to death uh, when I got it. And uh, so Jeff has worked on both of these watches and I actually have a third pocket watch, uh, this one here. And uh, this one doesn't have a family connection, but it's just one I picked up along the way. And the reason I pick this one up is because it is what's called a railroad watch and it's a little bit different than the other ones and I'll kind of show you the differences uh, than um, uh, a railroad watch and just a standard pocket watch. A lot of people call all these pocket watches railroad watches but there were true railroad watches in the day. So let me zoom you guys in here and uh, let you take a closer look at my pocket watches. So this again is the first one that I sent to Jeff uh, which was my grandfather's watch. I, I think it was made in the early 50s. Uh, but again, he got it running just fine. Uh, this is a decent quality watch. Um, in fact, I can't remember how many jewels it has. We'll, we'll take the back off here. And because uh, it's in here, this is kind of neat. Uh, if you've ever looked at these, I don't recommend taking them off a lot. This one here is a 17 jewel watch. And uh, you can see it running in there. You know, when you bought the watches from Elgin, you actually just bought the works and uh, the watch case itself was not made by Elgin. You would actually buy that from the jeweler and he would fit the works in there. And quite often they put a lot of decorative uh, uh, designs on these watches on the inside, even though you really didn't see them. But this is a 17 jewel watch. And again, uh, the jewels, uh, that's one way that they determine the quality of the watch. And the more jewels it had, uh, the better it would keep time. And they used the jewels, you can kind of see in here, these were used for bearings uh, for the uh, different moving parts to run on. And uh, the jewels have different, very low friction, so it'd be like a, a ruby or, I'm really not sure, but it was a, a jewel type material that was used in there. So anyway, he went through this one and got it restored for me. So this is again, 17 jewel. This is a pretty, pretty good watch. And uh, that was another reason when I, got my first ones restored uh, that I chose to use this one because this one was a much higher quality watch than this older one here. So this one here, we'll pull the back off of it. We'll just unscrew the case. There we go. And uh, again, you can see the uh, designs in there. This one here, Let's see how it says, how many jewels it has. I don't see it written on there, but uh, I think this one is only like seven jewels. So this was a lower quality watch. Um, and again, it was made about 1903 or 1904, if I remember right. And again, this one belonged to my great grandfather, Mr. Mose Fleming. Um, but even though it's not a real high quality watch, uh, this one here means a lot to me personally, just because uh, it did belong to my, my great grandfather. Now the, the last watch, again, this is not a, a family watch. This is a, a railroad watch and uh, it says on here BW Raymond, which was kind of the brand uh, for a high quality railroad watch. And this is a 21 jewel watch, uh, which is a really, really high end watch and one of the things that differentiates a railroad watch from other watches is is that the railroad watches were the, your, one of some of your highest grade watches that the watch companies made and uh, they typically kept better time um, than some of the lower grade uh, watches. The extra jewels in there, you know, on a railroad you're doing a lot of moving, a lot of bouncing, uh, so you, the extra jewels in there really kind of helped uh, keep them straight or help keep them running better. So we'll put the back back on this one. But another big differentiating feature of a railroad watch, if on a regular watch to adjust the time, you, or the stem on it, you turn it to, to tighten it and then change the time you pull it up and you turn it again and it'll change the dials. I don't want to move them right now because they're set. Uh, but that's how you would do it. You would pull that stem up. Well, on a railroad watch, they wanted to make sure that you couldn't easily um, bump the time off. 
Uh, and sometimes if you've ever carried a pocket watch, it was not uncommon in your pocket for that stem to get bumped and you could move the time out and, and get it messed up. So on a railroad watch, it's what they call a lever set watch. And to adjust the time on this, you actually had to unscrew the, uh, the crystal off of the front. And right down here is a little lever. Once you get that off, there's a little lever this built into it. So I'm gonna take this little chisel here and I'll pull this out. It's kind of hard to get out, at least on this watch, but there's a little lever there. And when you pull that lever out, now when you turn this, it actually changes the, the hands. It, this stem does not move up and down. And when you set it, you push that lever back in and then put the, uh, the, the crystal back on. So that was another um, added, um, way of making sure that these watches stayed set properly because it you had to you really had to go through a lot of steps to change the the time on on a, a railroad watch and uh, typically on a railroad watch they would set the time uh, once a day uh, in the morning they would synchronize their watch or whatever and then it would stay running all day long and they would have to test these watches from time to time for accuracy because the railroads obviously were keeping uh, close time so this is a much higher quality uh, watch, uh, the railroad grade watch. So uh, if anybody has an old pocket watch that they want to get uh, worked on, uh, I highly recommend Mr. Jeff Sexton. Uh, he did a great job for me. Uh, you know, I'm not getting anything out of this. He's not a machinist, but he is a true craftsman and I have a tremendous respect for that. And he's keeping a uh, art alive in these old pocket watches and timepieces and uh, I very much respect him for that. Uh, there's his uh, card there with his email on there. Uh, if, you, if you like pocket watches or interested, I recommend you check out his website at elgintime.com. He also has a Google Plus page uh, where he, uh, when a watch comes in to be worked on his shop, he actually uh, talks about it on his uh, Google Plus page and uh, shows pictures of it being disassembled and reassembled and talks about what has to be done to get individual watches uh, fixed. And then he'll usually post a little video of that watch running uh, once he gets it running again. So it's kind of interesting. You can kind of follow the work that's being done on his bench uh, uh, online. So anyway, you can check that out as well. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, seeing some pocket watches. Uh, I don't know if you're into pocket watches or not, but uh, I kind of like them. Uh, I don't ever wear a wristwatch. Um, long stories there, I have to tell you about some of my horror stories with wristwatches, but uh, I will occasionally wear a, a pocket watch. And when I'm up on the locomotive uh, steam engineering, I typically will have one in my pocket just because I'll carry this little railroad watch with me uh, just because just because it kind of helps you look better in character. Um, I will say on pocket watches, some things I've learned uh, from Mr. Sex into the process of this. Uh, a pocket watch should be cleaned regularly. Uh, if you got one, even if it's running, it's a good idea to send it off and have it cleaned uh, every so often. When they were using these things on a daily basis, they recommended having them cleaned and serviced once a year. Uh, and two, back in the old days, uh, the oils that they used to lubricate these with were uh, animal oil, usually like a whale oil, uh, which obviously we don't use whales for oil anymore. Uh, now the petroleum-based products that they put on these, they don't break down and the oils will actually last and lubricate much longer. So, you know, they now say probably every five to 10 years, you should just send it off and have it serviced uh, and have it cleaned and, and have it checked out. Uh, you know, another thing about pocket watches is, is while they do keep good time, uh, they're not near as accurate as modern watches. Obviously, modern technology, things have gotten better. Quartz watches will keep better time, but they're not near as neat as the mechanical nature of these pocket watches, which I like so much. Um, and, you know, getting one worked on, uh, you know, just to get one cleaned, uh, you're probably looking at, you know, $100, $150 from Mr. Sexton. Uh, which seems like a lot of money, but when you look at the time involved in it, it's, it's, it's not a lot of money. The problem is, is that the value of these pocket watches, you know, you would think these would be really high dollar, very valuable items, but they're really not worth a whole, most of them are not worth a lot of money. Now there's some that are collectible and that gets into a whole other realm of things. And quite honestly, particularly this, this older one that's not the higher quality, uh, you know, I spent 
probably a lot more money getting this thing fixed than what it's worth if I went out to sell it. But to me, it, this worth is not so much a, a monetary value. Uh, it's worth is because it's a family heirloom and uh, it is something that was passed down to me that belonged to my great grandfather. Uh, so to me having this running, uh, it's, it's, anyway, it's special to me and uh, it was worth every penny. Uh, that uh, Mr. Sexton charged me to get these fixed. Uh, but, you know, something to think about. So if you got some pocket watches, uh, get in touch with Mr. Jeff Sexton. He can get you fixed up if you need to have some work done to him. So there you go. That'll wrap up another episode of Odds and Ends. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that and got to see some neat things and uh, maybe uh, saw some new tools or whatever that you might be able to use. And uh, forgive me, I guess, for going on about pocket watches. But anyway, I thought some of you guys might be interested in these as well. So again, as always, I thank you to my many subscribers out there. I uh, did hit a milestone uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess actually while I was traveling on the road. We hit 20,000 subscribers, which I was really excited about. Uh, so uh, thank you to all of my subscribers out there. Uh, and as always, thank you for your comments and your likes uh, and all those good things. And so I appreciate every single one of you guys. Uh, we'll talk to you later.